Jesus says, All who thirst, come to the water. Come, all who are weary. Come, all who yearn for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ has washed over us, and our gracious and holy God beckons and blesses us. Drink deeply of these living waters. Glory to you, O Lord, glory to you. And as we gather together, we know that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And our grace to you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ our Lord, through the powerful work of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. We wait for the coming light of Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. We light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Isaiah 9, verse 2. Come, Lord Jesus, our light and our salvation. Let us walk in the light of the Lord.
On this first Sunday of Advent, we are reminded that God sent the Son into the world, for God loves us. And in the name of Jesus, we are reconciled with God and our sins are forgiven. With that in mind, please join me in a prayer of confession. Lord, we have not kept watch for you. We have occupied ourselves with our own concerns. We have not waited to find your will for us. We have not noticed the needs of the people around us. We have not acknowledged the love that has been shown to us. Forgive us for our lack of watchfulness. Help us to wait to know your will. Help us to look out for the needs of others. Help us to work and watch for your coming. Amen. Now hear the good news based on Jeremiah chapter 33. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. People of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose coming we announce this season is our righteousness. In Christ, we are made right with God. In Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And these words from Ephesians chapter 4 give us good guidance on how we ought to live to show our gratitude for God's love and forgiveness. Be kind and compassion to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Amen. Our Psalter reading is from Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved, O Lord God of hosts. How long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors. Our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved.
for a word for the children. Today, we start a new season in our church. It is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent means to come. I wonder if my friends know what's coming. Of course, Christmas is coming. This is an exciting time, but it may also be a difficult time of waiting. The year 2020 has been a year of waiting. We are waiting to see and hug our family and friends. We are waiting for a safe time to celebrate special occasions and holidays. We are waiting for a vaccine and order to return to life and end to chaos. With all the changes and uncertainty, it's good to remember that seasons of waiting are always with us. In his book, Oh, the Places You'll Go, Dr. Seuss talks about the waiting place. He describes it as a useless place where people are just waiting, waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go, waiting around for a yes or a no, waiting for your hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. Maybe we are waiting for God to show up and show us the next steps to take. What if during this season of Advent, as we wait for the Christ child, we are being blessed even during a pandemic? Do you hear God's call to slow down, to breathe deeply, to rest as we wait? As we look forward to Christmas Day, we also look forward to the day when Jesus will come again. Today, we light the candle of hope on our Advent wreath. Hope allows us to grow during a time of waiting and allows us to look forward. Hope is a need or a wish for something to happen, and hope is also about trust. Feeling hopeful during a time of chaos is not easy, but we must remember Jesus came to a disorderly world to bring order. So we can be hopeful and take comfort if we trust what we know about God. Our reading from 1 Corinthians reminds us God gives grace to us. We have been blessed in every way because of God. There is no gift of the Holy Spirit we do not have. We can be full of hope as we wait for Jesus to come again. God will keep us strong in faith, and God is faithful. Thanks to God, we have all we need to look forward to Christmas with hope. As we wait during this Advent season, I wonder if we can look forward with hope instead of looking back. I wonder if we can open our hearts to an Advent season that will allow God to surprise us with unexpected blessings as we wait with hopeful hearts for Christmas. Let us pray. Dear God, as we wait for Christmas, we worship and praise you. During this season, may we share the love of God by helping our neighbors and caring for others who struggle during this difficult time. As we do these things, may we find joy in the waiting place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we give our best, lest in gaining the world we lose life itself. As a covenant people, we seek to witness to your will and way. Help us to know more clearly what you would have us do with the wealth entrusted to, your, to our care. As we contribute to the needs of your people, we present ourselves as living sacrifices through Christ our Lord. Amen. of God, our first reading is from the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to our adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect. You came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. In a reading from the epistles, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord.
And our gospel reading from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. We've lit the first Advent candle, the candle of hope. And as the saying goes, hope springs eternal. The author of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 23 writes, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for, who, for he who has promised is faithful. However, talking about hope in, in the year 2020 is not easy. At the end of 2020, most people are eager and ready to put this year behind them. Now, it is true that 2020 has been a pretty chaotic year. It will go down in history as a challenging, dangerous, norm-shattering, and tragic year. No wonder that most people's hope is for things to return to normal. In a survey, the World Economic Forum warns that firms should not raise employees' expectations of getting back to normal. Instead, it writes, companies must confront reality, build resilience, and seek new opportunities. What a double-edged sword hope can be when the pandemic first struck, it fueled our efforts to unify and overcome a crisis of unknown proportions. But now the hope has been somewhat dashed, and this is testing even the toughest organizations. End of quote. In preparing for this sermon, I read an article about preaching during the season of Advent. I came across this paragraph, Advent preaching has never been easy anywhere or any time. This year, our Advent preaching brings with it, it, with it its own historical character and its own distinct challenges that cannot be ignored or simply subsumed into a kind of generalized, non-historical Advent preaching. And then it continues saying, among the distinctions of Advent this year for you as Christians are the hopes and fears being generated by a presidential election. Many will be wildly, deeply fearful about the future and others will be wildly confident about the possibilities of political power. End of quote. For your information, it wasn't written this year. It was written almost a decade ago. Believe it or not, Advent preaching always comes to people with only a faint hope, living in a chaotic, disorderly world where truth is evasive, power is searched for, and a world where people are fearful. Our world has always, always been unpredictable, messy, dangerous, and one where truth is elusive. As a matter of fact, the entire notion of hoping to go back to normal is questionable. What is normal? Was what we considered as normal in the past really that good? Should people of faith not rather be hoping for something new, 
something better, something different for the old has not really worked that well. So many questions. Where can we find order in the midst of chaos? Where can we find hope when we have no idea what the future holds for us? In a world where truth has become a scarce commodity, how should a preacher preach during this season of Advent? I, for one, am glad that we are reading the Gospel of Luke during this Advent season. I, like many of you this year, need an author who is less emotional, someone who thinks before he speaks, someone who is committed to bring some sanity to a crazy world. I need, perhaps most of all, someone who has done research to make sure that his words, are, his, his words withstand the test of time and the test of truth. This man is Luke, generally believed to have been a medical doctor. Someone who is schooled as an ancient scientist, a historian, and a travel companion of Paul. Luke is not giving a new account of events, but he is approaching the events in a more orderly fashion. This is what he writes. After investigating everything carefully, writing an orderly account so that you, Theophilus, may know the truth. Now, Theophilus could have been the governor of a Roman province, or as some scholars pointed out, that it was perhaps a code name for Christians who are beloved of God. Theos, philos, beloved of God. By the way, Luke's Greek writing was better than Matthew and Mark's. So in the midst of a chaotic world, where the Roman world is going through its own challenges, where the gospel of Jesus is threatened by external and internal factors, Dr. Luke, in a calm, historical, rational, and orderly way, is bringing good news and hope to his world. News that would transform the world. The first historical marker is Herod, the king of Judea. Herod the Great was not a nice man. Most of us know him as the one who, after the birth of Jesus, massacred children who were two years and younger in order to kill Jesus the Messiah. But he also executed one of his wives and three of his children. On the other hand, he was a prolific builder who renovated and expanded the temple in Jerusalem. And during the time of King Herod, a righteous couple living blamelessly according to the law and commandments suffered their own terrible fate. Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth are getting on in years, and Elizabeth was barren. In ancient Israel, having many children was a coveted honor and blessing. Sterility, on the other hand, was considered a trial, a chastisement from God, and a disgrace. So Luke's well-researched event of Jesus entering the world reveals two profound truths. The first one is, the world into which Jesus was born into is a world just like ours, where powerful people, ruthlessly and without consideration for others, determine how the world is run. Their decisions and actions have impact on others, and they don't care about those without power. Herod was responsible for infanticide and murders to achieve his goals. Today's powerful do not go to such extremes, even though some sometimes do. However, they also achieve their goals regardless of the consequences to others and the general health of this planet. The second truth is this. As powerful tyrants determine the direction of the world, humble and righteous people are struggling with their personal challenges and questions. Those challenges are perhaps different from the trials and disgrace of a barren womb, 
but they are still very real. Whether they are a health scare, economic uncertainty, food insecurity, worries about a child or an aging parent, or fear of the future, these concerns are real for many. In such a world, Luke is bringing a message of divine hope for our world. He has no doubt that the birth, the life, the death and resurrection encapsulate the kind of hope that is able to transform this world. His well-researched message of Christ being born has the power to change the old into something brand new. Power to transform the troubling and chaotic presence into a future that is filled with hope and joy. And Luke has a unique perspective on how the birth of Christ transformed the world to become a place where hope springs eternal. For Luke, Jesus was born into this world show God's love, to save sinners, and to offer forgiveness to all people. Yes, to all. Not only the Jewish people, but to all. Gentiles, sinners, tax collectors, men, women, and children. The remarkable angle of Luke's gospel is that Jesus' words and actions make clear that God has a particular soft spot for the humble, the poor, the outcast, and the vulnerable. Jesus calls the poor blessed. Shepherds are the first recipients of the good news of the birth of the, the Messiah. Women and children have a prominent place in Luke's gospel. Women, by the way, are the first witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. It may have been a shock for this methodical man to reach the conclusion that the advent of the Messiah would change the world so that the marginalized, the poor, and women found a place at the table. Luke was, after all, well-educated, sophisticated, and perhaps a man of means. But the truth cannot be silenced. God's plan of salvation was implemented, and in God's divine wisdom... It took on the paradoxical form of a humble infant born to a poor couple during a turbulent and chaotic time in history. The birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ transformed the world, and for Luke, there was no return to what was normal. The Christ event challenged him and us to focus on the future of Christ's return and not long for how things were in the past. So how do you think we are doing in this regard? How do you think the church is doing? My take is that the church often is more concerned about the past and how things were. The church wants to keep things normal. The church, instead of longing for Christ's future to arrive, are often complaining about the world that is changing so rapidly that we don't feel at home anymore. Instead of being excited about God's renewal of the world, where all nations, men, women, rich and poor, children and the age can rejoice in God's goodness, the church often wants to preser preserve what once was. This is not what God has in mind for God's people. God wants us to embrace and rejoice in God's transformational work. Did you know that the overarching theme of the Gospel of Luke is joy? From the very beginning to the end, Luke spells out that the Gospel, the good news of Jesus, is a joyful event. On almost every page of the gospel, we see joy, known to us by their Latin names, the Magnificat, Benedictus, Gloria in Excelsis. You see, God intervened in a chaotic world and transformed a world that is caught up in fear, greed, xenophobia, 
into a world of exuberant joy. The disorder in this world is now match, is no match for the divine joy that Jesus brings. We are already experiencing the joy, but we are still waiting for Christ to return. And as we all know, waiting is not easy. It's hard. The Christian, Christians in Corinth understood this as well. The Apostle Paul has a solid theological understanding of the church, that is, those who follow Christ. He says we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. We are even called saints. He continues saying that he gives thanks to God for, to the, for the congregation in Corinth. And then he says something that is truly remarkable, wonderful, and true. This is what he says. Because of God's grace in Jesus, we have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind. We don't lack any spiritual gift as we wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he continues saying, He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. By the grace of God, we have received everything we need to do what we are called to do while we are waiting. So our waiting is not a passive waiting. It is an active waiting for the world we live in is still chaotic, unfriendly, dangerous, and unwelcoming. There still is resistance against God's salvation plan for the world, for the powers are reluctant to let go. We who have seen God's transforming work in Christ, we who have seen the divine work in action, the joy it brings, the changing power of the gospel, we don't have time to waste. Luke, in his calm and reasoning fashion, has shown us that Jesus loves all. He welcomes all, from the poor, the sinners, women and children, and all those who are on the margins. We need to share this with the world while we are waiting. Are we equipped to do this challenging work? The apostle does not hesitate. Yes, we are. We have received everything we need. And now we just need to look forward and with joyous spirit share this wonderful news to all. Amen. now affirm our faith in the living God, and we do so with the church of all times and all places in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is holy and right to do so. We do give you thanks, O God, for the hope, the promise, and the joy of the season, O God, the season of new beginnings. We give thanks for the promise of all new beginnings, those in our own lives, those that promise new beginnings in our nation and the world. During this Advent, we give you thanks, O God, for all that is new and changing in our lives. As we begin this new church year, we give thanks, O God, for breakthroughs in the realms of science and medicine. We thank you for the promise of vaccines. We give you thanks for everything new, new books, new songs, new opportunities, a new way of looking at each other and looking at our world. We pray for our country, as so many people are sick and dying, divisions that are not healing, fear, fear, anger, and resentments that are growing. Transform us to be a new people, we pray. We thank you for the good news of Jesus and the joy his life brings to the world. We pray that your divine joy will continue to transform us and your world. We pray for those who are sick, hurting, mourning, and grieving. We lift up to your care Kay Bowder, Carolyn Cromer, Craig DeRusso, Sharon and Bob Ryder. We pray for the family of Reverend Earl Wilson, brother of Marilyn Frank, and uncle of Joan Graham. Reverend Wilson passed away on Wednesday. Comfort as only you can comfort, O God. We continue to pray for Billy Campbell and his family as they mourn the passing of Diane. And then we pray for baby Landon Groves and his family. We pray that the treatment for Landon's leukemia will be successful. Be with those who are homeless, O God, those who have lost hope. Teach us this season to share, to be generous, to support and encourage each other. Be with those who are lonely, those who suffer from addiction, and all who are crying out to you in despair. Use us to be instruments in your hands to transform, to bring hope, to bring joy. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
people of God, we have received the good news of joy of God sending the Son into this world to transform us and to transform the world. We have been equipped with everything we need to share this good news with others. Go into the world and share it. As you do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.